Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. And every now and then an urban legend. If you'd like to support our show, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawk media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And please be sure to check out our website at paradiseafterdark.com. Yes, on the website you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our merch store, mailing lists, links to social media, and of course our Patreon. When are we getting a dancing chicken? We should put a dancing chicken on our website. We need a dancing chicken on the website. I don't know what's coming to my head, but I just thought, you know, we have everything else there. Might as well get a dancing chicken too. Okay, well, I'll work on that. Okay, you work on that. So... On this particular website, you will also find a virtual tip jar. So if you leave us a tip, we'll give you a shout on the show. Speaking of shout outs, we have William from Gainesville, Florida. Ooh, home of Danny Rowling. Oh my gosh, yeah, the Gainesville Ripper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to be from there. I wonder if William was there when that happened. I don't know. Let us know, William. That'd be yeah, great. Shoot us an email, William. Also, a shout out to Olivia H. from Cape Coral. Thank you, Olivia. And one more, we have Christine from Boca Raton, Florida. Thank you, Christine. I'm telling you, well, you know, I I wonder why that is. I wonder why that is. (laughs) So, well, thank you, everybody, for giving us a little bit of a tip. We appreciate that. It does help to support the show. And thank you, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you later. (laughs) Oh, we're not. I thought thought we were done. Oh, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Um, I feel kind of bad laughing after that intro we just played for our listeners. We kind of needed to interject a little bit of it. Yeah, just like our last one, the du- the Vampire of Dusseldorf. You got to inter- interject some humor, otherwise you're just going to feel really depressed. Well, keep in mind, I'm a Libra, and everything in life is about balance. Well, I'm so, a Scorpio, so so you're a stinger. Anyway, we will be at CrimeCon in Las Vegas. April 29th through May 1st. If you have not got your ticket yet, please use code PARADISE for 10% off. And we hope to see you there. It's a great time. Always so much fun. Amazing people. And we are really looking forward to it. Yeah, it's only a few weeks away. So it's it's getting to be exciting time now. Yes. I mean, we're starting to prep. I mean, I'm already literally starting to think of what I got to pack. It's Vegas, baby. I know. What do you bring to Vegas? I'm bringing one outfit. Just one? Just one. You're going to be one pretty outfit. stinky after. No, I figure it's Vegas. I'll probably be naked after halfway through. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, I'm only kidding. So, right. on to a serious note. Picture you've made some plans for the evening. You decided you're going to go to see a concert. You get the tickets. You're excited. You get together with your friends, whatever it may be. And you show up and you order a drink. You're sitting there, you're relaxed. Everybody starts filling in. It's kind of getting crowded. And suddenly the band that you came to see shows up and is ready to play. And all this time you're so excited, you're pumped, and the band starts to play. And within minutes, your life is either changed or has ended. As you kind of heard in the opening there, this is what happens a few minutes after a concert begins. And you start hearing the cries and the screams and the fear that just echoed through the hall. And that audio that we played for you is real audio from someone who was filming inside the Station Nightclub, which is what we are covering this week, the Station Nightclub fire. So on February 20th of 2003... 100 people died and over 200 were injured at a rock concert at the Station Nightclub in West Warwick, Rhode Island. The Station Nightclub was a rundown roadhouse in the old New England mill town. The fire destroyed the club and remains the fourth deadliest nightclub fire in U.S. history. The blaze began just after 11 p.m. when the band, Great White, took the stage and their tour manager set off four large fountain fireworks. Two of the fountains were set to go straight up and the other two were at a 45 degree angle facing opposite directions. Now it was the angled fountains that were principally responsible for igniting the acoustic foam on the walls on either side of the stage. Now keep in mind, these fountains really are designed to be played in massive halls like uh, an arena or Or a football field or outdoors. 
The fire spread quickly along the foam that lined the walls and ceiling. The foam was intended to dampen sound. That's why it was there. I guess the cu- the club had gotten some complaints from people that lived in the neighborhood about the noise. So that's why they installed all this foam around the stage to try and dampen the noise. So 462 people were inside the building when the fire started. That's 58 above the building's official capacity limit. Now keep in mind too, when we talk capacity limit, we're talking staff, band members, people. Yes. So it's not you know, 58 people above the limit of guests. That's everyone in its entirety. Ironically, the night that the tragedy occurred, a local news crew was on hand at the station nightclub to report on the issue of nightclub safety. Four days earlier, 21 people had been killed during a stampede at a club in Chicago. Helping out with the report was Jeffrey Derdarian, who co-owned the station with his brother Michael. That night, they were expecting a full house to see the heavy metal band Great White. Now, Great White was no small-time local band. Forming in L.A. in 1977, Great White peaked with several albums during the late to mid-1980s, including the platinum-selling records Once Bitten in 1987 and Twice Shy in 1989. Those album singles Rock Me and Once Bitten, Twice Shy received considerable airplay through radio and MTV. Keep in mind, this is 2003. These were still those 80s hair bands, rock bands that were still popular with a lot of people. They charted two top 40 hit singles on the Billboard Hot 100 with Once Bitten, Twice Shy and The Angel Song. They continued to release new material into the 1990s. In early 2002, after breaking up and getting back together, they went on a reunion tour, calling themselves Jack Russell's Great White. Yeah, because I think it was only two original members of the band. So that's why it was Jack Russell's Great White, because he was the lead. And then he had, I think, the drummer or maybe the bass player. They were together on this particular tour. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. But the tour was to consist primarily of classic songs from the Great White catalog with some of Russell's solo work mixed in. The tour was going so well that eventually more dates were added and the tour extended through the early months of 2003. February 20th of 2003 was the last show of that tour. Well, soon after the fire started, the band noticed immediately that something was wrong with the lead singer Jack Russell actually stopping the song and saying, that's not good, right before they escaped out on exit behind the stage. And if you go back and re-listen to the very beginning, you can actually hear him say that in the the recording. uh, In the audio, in the intro. Exactly. So the fire reached flashover within one minute, causing all combustible materials to burn. For those who are not familiar, flashover is a thermally driven event during which every combustible surface exposed to thermal radiation in a compartment or enclosed space rapidly and simultaneously ignites. Flashover normally occurs when the upper portion of the compartment reaches a temperature of approximately 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit for ordinary combustibles. Now, this is all per FEMA website. For a short time, no one realized the severity of the situation. As the fire spread rapidly, though, panic ensued. As black smoke filled the club's interior, the desperate rush of people to the front entrance caused a pileup, trapping people right where they stood. Now, many people were trampled and crushed to death just feet from freedom. The acoustic foam that was burning produced a dense toxic fog, making it nearly impossible to see, and some died within minutes of breathing it in. And the rest of the people who died did so from the actual fire itself. Now, the toxic smoke, heat, fire, and the resulting human rush toward the main exit killed 100 people, and 230 were injured, and another 132 escaped uninjured that we know of. We don't know what transpired after the fact because of the result of this toxic fumes. Right. Now, most of the bodies, they were found near the front entrance, and that, to me, just seems horrific. Yeah. Among the dead was Great White's guitarist, Ty Longley. It said that he initially escaped the blaze when he ran out the back exit, but ran back inside and tried to save his guitar, where he ended up consuming the toxic fumes, which eventually caused his death. Now, in the weeks following the tragedy, Great White was the target of public outrage and faced the possibility of prosecution. So 
they're literally... They're blaming Great White, the band. Exactly. Well, let's take a look at exactly what went wrong here. So try and follow along with me here. On February 27th of 2003, under the authority of the National Construction Safety Team, NCST Act, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, established a national construction safety team to determine the likely technical cause or causes of the building failure that led to the high number of casualties in the fire. First, we need to understand the club itself. So the Station Night Club was located at 211 Cosset Avenue, West Warwick, Rhode Island. It was a single-story wood frame building with a footprint of about 4,484 square feet. It was built in 1946. Not quite up the code. The main entrance on the north side with double doors led to a short hallway with a single interior door. In addition to the main entrance, there were doors leading directly to the outside adjacent to the platform, commonly but less precisely referred to as the stage, on the west end of the building and at the side of the main bar at the east end of the building. The kitchen also had an exit door. Parking for over 100 cars was provided in the front and to the west side of the building. Entering from the front through the double doors would have brought one into a short entrance hall with a single door at the far end that led to a ticket taker area. So imagine you're walking with me here through these double doors and you go down a hallway, a single door, and you, you meet a ticket taker. To the right of the ticket taker was an assembly area containing a dance floor and a sunroom or what they called the pool room, elevated dining area and a platform which served as the stage with a drummer's alcove. The dressing room was situated in the northwest corner and an exit to the outside was located between the platform and the dressing room. Except for the front of the sunroom, which was composed of darkened glass windows, there were no other windows in the right half of the nightclub. Turning left at the ticket taker area would have brought you into the main or horseshoe bar room. So it's a bar and, there, and there's a horseshoe bar. You know mm-hmm. what I mean by that? Yep. An exit to the outside was located on the far left wall. There were no windows on that wall, but windows lined most of the front of the main bar room. So there's windows in the front of the building, but not the side, but there is a door on the side. Which would make sense if you're in an area that's going to play music because you don't want windows because they're not conducive for great sound. The kitchen separated the main bar room from a smaller assembly area or what they called a dart room and a back bar. There was one door to the outside from within the kitchen. A storage area, office, and restrooms were located in the back of the nightclub. There were no additional exits leading directly to the outside from these rooms. Any windows or exits that had been installed were covered with bars or paneling. So as mentioned, the fire began when the pyrotechnics used during the performance of the band ignited the polyurethane foam lining portions of the walls and ceilings of the platform and spread quickly along the ceiling area over the dance floor. Smoke was visible in the exit doorways in a little more than one minute and flames were observed breaking through a portion of the roof in less than five minutes. That is not a lot of time, Lauren. The direct contributors to this large loss of life were found to be one the hazardous mix of building contents, two, the inadequate capability to suppress the fire during its early stages of growth, and three, the inability of the exits to handle all of the occupants in the short time available for such a fast-growing fire. The acoustic foam was installed in two layers with highly flammable urethane foam on top of polyethylene foam, the latter being difficult to ignite but releasing much more heat once ignited by the less denser urethane. 
Burning polyurethane foam instantly develops opaque dark smoke along with deadly carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide gas. Anyone who has burnt a styrofoam cup in a fire, thrown it in there, and you see how it melts in that black, hard smoke that comes off of there. Even green. The fire turns green. It's exactly. So it's this. it's a different type of smoke than you're used to. Well, inhaling this smoke only two to three times would cause rapid loss of consciousness and eventually death by internal suffocation. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's instant asphyxiation. The capability to suppress this fire during its early stage of growth was insufficient, primarily because automatic fire sprinklers were not installed in the station nightclub. So, side note, that while the 2003 edition of the model codes would have required sprinklers to be installed for new construction, sprinklers would not have been required for an existing structure, like the station. So, it was built before the building codes changed. So, sort of grandfathered in. The building was equipped with handheld fire extinguishers, although they were not located Convenient to where the fire started and the employees of the station were not even trained to use the handheld fire extinguishers. And it is unclear if the extinguishers would have been effective in controlling the fire anyway. Most of the fatalities occurred in the moments prior to the arrival of the first emergency service units. So with that being said, just picture this fire starts and within six minutes... Of the fire starting, the fire department shows up. But at this point, we've already had people rushing out. The fire is already consuming most of the building. There's black smoke throughout. Yep. And with that, let's take a quick break. Okay, so like I said, Lauren, the fire engines began to arrive. And this is approximately six minutes after the fire started. Now, they set up a triage area near the street and within... 15 minutes, the fire dispatcher advised triage that Kent County Hospital was overwhelmed with injured victims and that additional victims should be directed to Rhode Island Trauma Center. And triage responded that the rescue units were using their own discretion as to which hospital the victims were being transported. And within 30 minutes of the firefighters' arrival, the roof of the building collapsed. So now we're only 30 minutes and we're talking about this entire 4,500 square feet roughly Building, building just collapsed. basically collapsed. Now, the Warwick Ladder Unit raised its ladders and began applying a master stream to the fire through the roof. Approximately 10 minutes after the collapse of the main roof section, a portion of the roof around the sunroom, it collapsed. The human crush at the exit, because most of the patrons at the station that night were not familiar with the layout of the club and knew of no other exits aside from the main exit. The main corridor at the front exit was quickly jammed with bodies, causing many people to be trampled and crushed. Eyewitnesses and video of the incident show the front door open, and it was packed so tightly with people that even patrons who were already outside and had escaped couldn't pull anyone free to safety. Now imagine that, Lauren. Yeah, so like imagine that you're packed in so tightly, and I've I've actually seen video of this, and there is video out there of this happening the state the people in the exit and they're trying to pull them out but they're so jam-packed so tightly together that they can't pull them out well the way i did it is i closed my eyes and imagined myself being stuck in a situation where you just we talked about the diver that got that got we feel like he got stuck somewhere and couldn't get through and got trapped underwater yes Similar to that. Ben McDaniel. Exactly. But you're surrounded by people. So not only, but not only you're not alone, there's people there and everyone is so packed in they can't get through because they jammed this hallway. That to me is so frightful. The, the idea of the panic that someone would be going through yeah, is just horrible. Well, in the report from the National Construction Safety Team, we learned a lot about the club and their safety measures, or lack thereof. Computer simulations with a fire dynamic simulator and a mock-up of the stage area and dance floor concluded that the fire sprinkler system would have contained the fire long enough to give everyone time to exit safely. However, because of the building's age and size... 
Many believed the station to be exempt from the sprinkler system requirement. In fact, the building had undergone an occupancy change when it was converted from a restaurant to a nightclub. This change dissolved its exemption from the law, a fact that West Warwick fire inspectors never noticed. So on the night in question, the station was legally required to have a sprinkler system, but did not. So you're saying that when they they were okay and grandfathered, but when they altered the business of from a restaurant to a nightclub, they lost the exemption that they had for the restaurant to not have the need for the sprinkler system. Yes. Okay. So they they were legally required to have them, but didn't. So let's talk about the acoustic foam real quick. Combustible interior finishes, scenery, and decorations have played an unfortunate but significant role in fires that have occurred in places of assembly for over the last, like, hundred years, often resulting in hundreds of fatalities. Examples of these fires include the Iroquois Theater. 602 people died in Chicago in 1903. The Rhythm Club. 207 fatalities in Natchez, Mississippi in 1940, and the Coconut Grove fire, 492 died in Boston in 1942. And this is the one that ranks number one as far as nightclub tragedies. It yes. ranks number one on the list. The Coconut Grove fire. Yeah, keep in mind that the case tonight ranks number four. In each of these incidents, fire-related material properties, including ignitability, heat release rate, and rapid flame spread contributed significantly to the fire growth that resulted in the tragic loss. So at the station nightclub fire, keep in mind that this foam was installed from floor to ceiling all around the stage and the drummer's alcove. So there was a lot of this foam in the nightclub. Designed to obviously dampen the sound to keep the sound from getting out and also to keep it in to make it sound a little better within the building. Right. Same thing we do in the studio as we're recording here. We make sure we got sound dampening material around us and in between us and all that to produce the best sound quality possible. It's ideal for what they do as a nightclub where they bring in guests to sing and put on shows. Okay, Lauren. So now that we know exactly what happened and what caused the deaths and the injuries, we need to ask who was responsible for this mass tragedy. Now, nine months after this horrific night, following an extensive investigation, criminal charges were brought against three people. Daniel B. Shell, the tour manager of the band who had set off the fireworks, and Jeffrey and Michael Derdarian, who are brothers and the owners of the station nightclub. Now, they were each charged with 200 counts of involuntary manslaughter, That's two per death because they were indicted under two separate theories of the crime. Criminal negligence manslaughter resulting from a legal act in which the accused ignores the risk to others and someone is killed. And misdemeanor manslaughter resulting from a petty crime that causes a death. Right? I mean, that's correct. Yes. Okay. The first criminal trial was against Great White's tour manager, Daniel Bichelle. Now, why was he charged? Bichel is who brought the polytechnic displays into the club, set them up, and set them off. Now, these fireworks were the catalyst of this mass tragedy. The owners of the nightclub deny that they gave Bichel permission to use the fireworks during the show. This is something that was highly disputed by Bichel and the band, but it's a he said, she said situation there. The trial was scheduled to start May 1st of 2006, but Bichel, against his lawyer's advice, pled guilty to 100 counts of involuntary manslaughter on February 7th of 2006 in what he said was an effort to, quote, bring peace, I want this to be over with. On May 10th, 2006, state prosecutor Randall White asked that Bichel be sentenced to 10 years in prison the maximum allowed under the plea bargain, citing the massive loss of life in the fire and the need to send a message. Speaking to the public for the first time since the fire, Bichel appeared remorseful during his sentencing. In his statement, he said, 
For three years, I've wanted to be able to speak to the people that were affected by this tragedy, but I know that there's nothing I can say or do that will undo what happened that night. Since the fire, I have wanted to tell the victims and their families how truly sorry I am for what happened that night and the part that I had in it. I never wanted anyone to be hurt in any way. I never imagined that anyone ever would be. I know how this tragedy has devastated me, but I can only begin to understand what the people who lost loved ones have endured. I don't know that I'll ever forgive myself for what happened that night, so I can't expect anyone else to. I can only pray that they understand that I would do anything to undo what happened that night and give them back their loved ones. I'm so sorry for what I have done, and I don't want to cause anyone any more pain. I will never forget that night, and I will never forget the people that were hurt by it, and I am so sorry. If you can hear him in court reading this, you can feel it's he's showing true remorse. Superior Court Judge Francis J. Derrigan Jr. sentenced Bichelle to 15 years in prison with four to serve and 11 years suspended, plus three years probation for his role in the fire. Judge Derrigan remarked, The greatest sentence that can be imposed on you has been imposed on you by yourself. Under this sentence, with good behavior, Bichelle would be eligible for parole in September of 2007. Judge Derrigan deemed Bichelle highly unlikely to reoffend, which was among the mitigating factors that led to his decision to impose the sentence. The parole board unanimously decided in September of 2007 to release Bichelle early, saying that he showed genuine remorse and had the support of family members of the victims. Bichelle was freed from prison in March of 2008 after serving less than half of his four-year sentence. Now, surprisingly, as I just mentioned, Bichelle received a lot of support from the families of the fire victims. And this was probably because of his obvious remorse. Mm-hmm. Over, I mean, this guy was like, beating himself up he he felt terrible and the fact that he sent each family a handwritten letter after his sentence to express his remorse wow that's not something that you usually hear about no this he i think he was sincerely very remorseful yep and uh, let's take a quick break here lauren and just kind of take it all in Let's discuss the other parties involved here, the Dedarian brothers. On the other hand, these two gentlemen pled not guilty to all charges. Now, why were they charged? They were accused of operating a nightclub in a negligent manner, particularly because they installed soundproofing foam on the club's walls without having it tested for flammability or registering it with a town, West Warwick, as required by the state's fire code. Obviously, you want to install something like that, you have to make sure that you get a hold of the county and say, hey, is this stuff correct? Am I doing the right thing? What? Yeah. That's why permits are very, very important, especially when you own a business. Now, there were also no safety sprinklers in the building, as we discussed earlier, and they allowed the occupancy to be over the capacity. However, on September 21st, 2006, Judge Derrigan announced that the brothers had changed their pleas from not guilty to no contest, thereby avoiding a trial. Under the plea agreement announced in a letter to victims' families by Rhode Island's Attorney General, one of the men, Michael Dodarian, will be sentenced to serve four years in a minimum security prison. His brother, Jeffrey Dodarian, will be sentenced to three years of probation and 500 hours of community service. In his letter, the Attorney General Patrick Lynch wrote, quote, Despite their desire to admit to the charges against them, I was unwilling to recommend or agree to the sentences that I have been advised the court will impose. End quote. He added, most significantly, I strongly disagree with the court's intention to sentence Jeffrey Durden to less than jail. Jeffrey Durden was in the club the night of the fire, but the authorities have said Michael Dodarian played a greater role in buying and installing the highly flammable sound insulating foam around the stage that was almost instantly ignited by their pyrotechnics. So the foam, it plays a huge portion into how unsafe this nightclub was. Well, unlike when Bichelle took a plea deal, the Durdarian brothers' plea deal angered many relatives of the victims, as well as some of the 200 people who were injured in the blaze. 
As far as I'm concerned, these guys are getting away with murder, said Charles Sweet of Pembroke, Massachusetts, whose son, Sean, was killed in the fire. And he told this to the New York Times. I really thought that these two guys would be facing some serious jail time. I mean, they had 440 people inside that club and the capacity was 300. My wife and I are devastated. Anna Gruda Duria, whose daughter Pam, 33, the 100th victim, died after being hospitalized for two and a half months after the fire, said, I think it's awful. She said that many victims and relatives wanted to see the Dardarians face trial, especially Michael. I just wanted to see his face, she said. I just wanted to see him go through something the way we did with our daughter. After four years, he'll be walking free. My daughter is six feet under. I'll never see her face again. In January 2008, the parole board decided to grant Michael Dardarian an early release. He was scheduled to be released from prison in September 2009, but was granted his release in June 2009 for good behavior. Now, I do agree that there was some responsibility of the brothers because they own the nightclub and set it up. But I am – everything that I read and I found really makes me so angry at Bichelle, even though I think he showed genuine remorse. I think his remorse stems from the fact that he was really the one – who is the most responsible for all of this occurring because he said at the pyrotechnics, he claims that he got permission, but there was no guarantee that he got permission. It was kind of a handshake deal, if you will. And he's the one that pushed the button and fired off the pyrotechnics. So to me, it seems like the guy that was really backed by the families was the one most responsible. But I guess it has a lot to do with the way that you portray yourself in the trial. You know, so the way that he went after it, he felt remorseful. I think it was a genuine, I think he he was very genuine in his remorse, but I also think that he was probably the most responsible. Now, also, Lauren, with this case, there were also several lawsuits pertaining to the Station Nightclub fire. Now, remember the the sound foam that we'd been talking about numerous times? It instantly ignited and filled the club with toxic fumes? Yes. Well, the company, American Foam, sold this club $575 worth of foam in June of 2000. Now, this is only three months after the Dardarians became the owners. And the experts, fire experts, claim that these blocks of egg crate-style polyurethane panels burned like gasoline. They emitted the dense fog with these toxic gases. And they're claiming that it's not suitable as an acoustic insulation. So the settlement with them was totaled at $6.3 million dollars. Now, American Foam's insurer paid out $5 million, and the corporation American Foam paid out $1.3 million. Now, according to what I found in the New York Times, the cameraman, Brian Butler, who worked for WPRI-TV, we mentioned him earlier. He was at the nightclub gathering videotape for the segment on safety in public spaces. Now, Mr. Butler was involved in a lawsuit along with WPRI-TV. Now, his video showed that the early moments of the fire which revealed the rapid spread of the flames and the mad rush for the exits. So lawyers for the victims that sued had accused Mr. Butler of impeding the crowd's exit through the front door, where many of the bodies were ultimately found. I mean, obviously, he and his lawyer, Chip Babcock, denied the claim, but all in all, WPRI-TV and Mr. Butler would agree to a $30 million settlement with the survivors of the fire and the relatives of those who died. So he's claiming that because he was filming, he was actually blocking the doorway. Well, if you watch that video, which which is available on YouTube, uh, you can see kind of how he he kind of was. Well, they were claiming that he didn't help either. Well, I saw the video. He came through the exit, got out. He was one of the first ones out. And then he ran around the side of the building and you could see flames coming out the side door. He ran around the other side. Um, I do believe at some point he did go to the front door and try and help, but he was filming the whole time, the whole time. Well, it cost him $30 million stating that he should have gotten out of the way. There were several lawsuits. I mean, Home Depot was sued. There were, why was Home Depot? Sued? I, I, did, I didn't want to get into all that. Cause it was, it, I'm not going to say it was a small settlement cause it wasn't. We're in the millions of dollars, but 
clear broadcast channel. A lot of these companies were sued. It had to do with a lot of the equipment that was used, the glue for the foam paneling. I mean, any and everybody that lawyers could get their hands on in this case. There was one that I want to discuss with you, and I want to get your opinion on this. The one that I disagree with. Now, I, I can kind of see in other situations where, yeah, the equipment that was there, the equipment that was sold, the, you know, not having the safety sprinklers, the fire extinguishers rather, not the door exits. There's a lot of things that were involved, and I agree with some of that. This one I don't. And Heiser Bush and a local distributor, McLaughlin and Moran, they agreed to pay out $21 million to the victims of the nightclub fire. Now, the companies did not admit any wrongdoing but were named in the lawsuit because the plaintiffs representing those killed said the two companies promoted the concert. So, uh, Anheuser-Busch says, hey, you know, come see Great White at the Station Not Club Fire. We're going to promote this. They promote it on radio. They promote it. $20 million because they promoted it? I don't think I don't think that they could be held responsible for promoting an event they had nothing to do with the club. They they had no way of knowing what was going to happen. I mean, I don't know. I I guess maybe I probably don't agree with that either. But legally... I think what happens usually in these cases, and you'd probably agree with this, is a lot of times when the name, they bring it out there, they, they just want to settle. So they just say, okay, what does it take? And they just get done with it. But yeah. I just don't think in heiser Bush. And this local little brewery or distributor gets involved and it's like, hey, we're just promoted it. All we said was, hey, come see the show, you know, but I guess maybe they should have, quote, done their due diligence to see if the club that they were promoting was safe and sufficient. It's it, it that's 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 a real fine line and that's a gray area. But that's one of those things where, you know, when a situation like this occurs, this was a criminal case. I mean, the people died. This was, in some case, I mean, we're talking manslaughter. And to me, it just seems like this is a tragedy that could have been prevented if some due diligence was done in the first place. If they didn't try to, you know, slide under the radar saying, hey, we don't have to get all the fire explainers and bring everything up to code. because." Well, and that's where I think the Dardarian brothers hold a lot of responsibility. Yes, I think that they were negligent. This is just my opinion. I mean, but I think that they were negligent in not making sure that their building was as safe as possible. I mean, even just just like an example of of something along these lines. So our dogs like to dig holes. And they've been digging right outside our screen patio door. And I'm um, constantly filling it in and Ken is constantly filling in the hole. And I think to myself, if someone comes over, comes outside and trips and falls because of that hole, that's a lawsuit. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, of course, I don't want anybody to trip and fall and break their ankle or something at my house, but I also don't want to be sued. I mean, there's, there's, but what do you do? It's not like you can do anything with a dog. You know, well, no, I know. Stop. I do. That's why we got to keep <laughs> filling in the stupid hole. I know. So <laughs> I get what you're saying, though. I understand but the I analogy mean, like, what you're bringing up. You, especially if you had a business. I mean, even if you don't care about people, you should at least care about not getting sued. True. True. <laughs> Well, I think these guys bought this club, and I think they had spent so much money up to this point. I'm not sure the the dynamics of it, but you know, with them, I think that they probably just tried to slide under the radar, and maybe they had no knowledge. Maybe they bought this place and they didn't realize that they needed to do all this stuff to update it. And again, who? No one thinks a tragedy is going to happen until it does. So I guess in this case, it turns out that you know maybe they will never do it again because once bitten, twice shy. Nice. All right, that's going to be it for tonight. Yep, everyone, that will be it. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. And again, that's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And be sure again to check out our website for links to all of our social media, Patreon, merch store, and much, much more. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really, really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And again, thank you everyone for listening to Paradise After Dark. Dark, dark, dark.